the greeting. God comes into a world filled with uncertainties and darkness. God embraces the wounded and broken. God is the candle shining in the darkness of our days. God is the one who makes all things new. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join me in affirming our Christian faith, uniting in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Psalter today is Psalm 147. Together we will have verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. A song of praise is fitting. The Lord 
The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and abundant in power, whose understanding is beyond measure. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, who covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow upon the hills. The Lord takes no delight in the might of a horse, nor pleasure in the strength of a runner. Amen. I wanted to share with y'all what my favorite Bible story is um, today, just so that maybe you can tell me if you have a favorite Bible story later on, but I wanted to share with you mine. It's, it's very short. Um, often we like short stories, don't we? we? Long passages can get complicated and challenging, but short's good. Um, and my favorite Bible story comes from, it's in a couple of Gospels, but my favorite version is in Mark. And it's in chapter 4, and it's Jesus stilling the storm. And I wondered if it was okay with y'all if I just read it for you first. It says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him up to say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up, rebuked the wind, said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so the reason that's my favorite Bible story is because when Jesus and the disciples get in the boat, what happens is they're trying to get to the other side and a storm happens. Do y'all think boats were as, as powerful as they are now? You think they were made of metal 2,000 years ago? Probably not. They were made of wood. And so a massive storm beating against this pitiful boat, probably pretty scary. And so what happens is they find Jesus in the midst of the boat getting swamped. He's not only asleep, Mark says, but he's sleeping on a pillow which I always have found funny. And so they wake him up. Jesus, why don't you care? We're dying. We're perishing. Jesus wakes up, stops the storm, tells the disciples, you have no faith. Uh, and they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? But the part of that I wanted you to hear is actually the very beginning. Because some would say we're living in a storm now, that the waves are crashing into the boat and it's difficult. And so where might Jesus be? Jesus might be in our boat with us. That's definitely the case. But one thing that I think gives us hope from this passage is actually the very first verse of it. When it says, on that day evening had come, he, Jesus, said to them, let us go across to the other side. And so the best part of this passage is the realization that it was Jesus' idea in the first place to get in the boat. And so indeed we will make it to the other side. And so life and school or all of that might be just absolutely difficult. But the good news is, is Jesus invited us into the boat, into relationship with him, and indeed we're going to get to the other side. And I just wanted to share with that with you all. That's how I have always heard that story and something I think of often when I'm going through difficult things, that it was Jesus who invited me into it to start with. So I wanted to share that for you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for these, your children. Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless them, Lord. Help them to know your presence, Lord. Help them to know that you are indeed with them in their boat. Lord, you did invite them into this, Lord, and that you will see them to the other side, just as you have, Lord, for generations. Lord, we thank you for their teachers, their families, those taking care of them. Lord, we just ask that you continue to be with them in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. If not, let us then go to the Lord in prayer.
Gracious Lord, we do come to you now, Lord, in this moment to give thanks, God, that you are gathering us in a space of worship. Lord, we thank you for this awesome ability and to have a special encounter with you this week. Lord, gathered as your community to celebrate, God, the word and the sacrament today. Lord, we thank you that you are uniting us at your table in a time such as this. Lord, we pray and just give thanks, Lord, that you are indeed in our midst this morning. That, Lord, you are in our lives, present in our situations. That, Lord, we can turn our burdens over to you. Lord, and leave this space lighter than how we entered it. Lord, we just ask that you be with the, the many names that we have named before you, God. The many names already present on our prayer list. Lord, we call upon you to bring healing, Lord, where healing is needed. We pray, Lord, for you to bring peace where peace is needed. Lord, be with those like Stuart who are in the hospital this very moment. Lord, we pray that they might recover quickly. That, Lord, you will continue to allow for improvements to be made. That, Lord, you will be so present with all of those today who are either sitting in a hospital, Lord, or the family of those waiting patiently at home. Lord, give them peace. And again, Lord, we call upon you to bring healing. Lord, we call upon you to be with those this week who have lost loved ones. Again, Lord, you know that this is such a difficult time. Lord, we call upon you to bring mercy, bring peace. Lord, we thank you for our health care officials in the midst of this, our health care experts, and all those working in the field, on the front lines, on our behalf. Lord, we just pray that you would protect them and be with their families. Lord, as always, we thank you for our teachers and our, those who work in our school system. Lord, we thank you for parents, those who take care of children. Lord, we pray that you would give them rest. Lord, we call upon you to continue to be with us in our community. Call us to share the gospel with one another. Help us to have opportunities to bring good news to those, Lord, who see nothing but darkness. Help us to see light when we see nothing but darkness. Lord, this morning, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, and his resurrection that, Lord, we can have new life in your Son. That, Lord, there is always a new start that we get every morning. We pray, Lord, giving thanks for that privilege that is so freely offered through your Son's sacrifice. And so with, Lord, the saints in glory in the church universal, we unite this morning prayer, praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to join me in prayer once more, praying over the offering that we collect uh, there in the vestibule. Gracious God, we do thank you, Lord, for these, your gifts. Lord, we ask that you bless them, bless them to the ministries of your church. God, we thank you for our ability to give, and Lord, we just ask that you would call us to 
Lord, to share the gifts and resources that you have so uh, lovingly bestowed upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been a minute since we've heard from our friend Paul. We've had numerous kind of Old Testament and Gospel readings over the last couple of months. Uh, thought about time Paul uh, make his appearance once again. Uh, but this is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 through 23. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this on my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as, to, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I couldn't help but think about Halloween costumes this week as I read this passage. Um, and the reason is, is I was coming across some studies that were suggesting that children are more productive and task-oriented when wearing superhero costumes. That if you let a child wear their Spider-Man Halloween costume, for whatever reason, it just increases the likeliness that they finish tasks, that they do homework, that they do a chore. I know when the pandemic started and the shutdown was happening, Experts were telling people who were working from home, you know, still get dressed as if you're going to the office, right? This recommendation born out of the belief that getting dressed for work puts us in a working mindset, makes us more productive. I think clothing and what we wear are parts of who we are. I think it reflects our interests, our occupations, even where we're from. Everyone in South Carolina, for the most part, we all either have something with an orange tiger paw on it, or other of us have something with a black or garnet gamecock on it. For some people, they wear boots here in the South. Some wear bright pastels, right? Some wear seersucker and linen. All things that we associate with being from the South, they're part of an identity. I remember visiting my uncle who works in the Pentagon, and he took us to his job to see the Pentagon, which is always cool. But my takeaway from it was that every person there all wears long black trench coats like it was men in black. It's like they just handed them out if you moved in. Your mortgage, here's a black trench coat. No purple, no blue or green or yellow, just black. It was very clear that muted colors were expected to wear anything else. You would have earned yourself those famous, you aren't from here, are you, stares. Clothing is fascinating if you really stop to think about it because we communicate with clothing. If we're at a funeral or a wedding, we dress differently than we would at a ball game. If we're going to a job interview, we might dress even differently than we would for the job we are applying for. It's interesting, but I grew up waking up on Sunday mornings being told to put on church clothes. I wanted to wear my basketball shorts and t-shirt, and they never matched. 
But it was important to my mother that we wore church clothes. I think what we wear and why we wear what we wear are born from who we are. We're bo it's born out of our story. It's born out of our location and our time period. My parents' pictures from high school look like people from the 80s, right? And what we wear changes just simply by putting us in a different building, putting us at a different event, putting us even here just on a different day. What I love about this particular passage is that every time I read it, I always wonder if I read it right. That Paul makes several statements that he has become like others in order to share the gospel. He says, I'm like a person living under the law for those living under the law. He says, I'm like a person who, when I'm with people outside of the law, I live as if I'm outside of the law. All of that culminating to what sounds contradictory, I think, to what we are told. And even what we believe is possible. Paul says, I have become all things to all people. And if you're like me, when I read that, I thought to myself, no, no. I remember again and again hearing people give me the advice that I cannot possibly be all things to all people. That inherently we will come to moments where we make decisions and we know no matter which decision it is, it might be unpopular. And so we say to the person that's stuck in that dilemma, you can't be all things to all people. And Paul, of all people, should know that. This is a guy that was put in jail again and again, a guy who was chased out of town again and again. Surely he would know that this standard he is setting is not possible, not even for Paul himself. At some point, no matter how hard we try, we cannot be all things for all people. Inherently, we will encounter no-win situations. Something has to give. But something that is important to know from the verses leading up to this passage that I think helps make sense of Paul's words is that Paul is writing to address how he himself has related to this church in Corinth. Paul is stating that apostles such as himself are well within their right to ask for compensation just as they are within their right to get married, he says. Paul explains, however, that he's waived both of those rights. He's refusing payment. He's re refraining from getting married for the purpose of making the gospel, quote, free of charge. Which is to say that Paul's sharing of the gospel is uninhibited by financial and relational commitment. Many scholars point out that Paul is a very privileged person in this time period as he is highly educated. Commentators note that Paul's ability to go uncompensated was not duplicable by many others doing the same work because Paul had certain advantages that others simply did not have. And Paul seems to know this because he even quotes from the Law of Moses to make the point that an apostle should be compensated. This entire argument, all of that is simply to build towards Paul's larger point about how Paul and in turn the church are called to relate to each other and to the world. Paul speaks about rewards, says his reward for his effort is that the gospel's free, that he is free from any commitments. But as we see from Paul, he does not see himself as free to do as he pleases, to do whatever he wants but in constant and required service to all people that he encounters. He says, if I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. An obligation is laid on me. Woe to me if I don't proclaim the gospel. And again, Paul says, for I am free with respect to all. I have made myself a slave to all. Paul's compensation then, in his mind, is the work of sharing the gospel. Paul's family then are the people in which he encounters. Quite the standard. Paul seems to set the bar high, as he likes to do. And then he says, and by the way, I'm all things to all people. And for a lot of people, Paul sometimes comes across as arrogant. But what's missed in Paul's words is actually something extremely life-giving and important. And is actually Paul's entire point. You see, when Paul says he is all things to all people, he's referring back to how he adjusts himself in relationship 
to those he's around. To the Jews, I became a Jew. To those under law, I became under the law. And so on. The common thread that strings this passage from beginning to end is that Paul is trying to get the Corinthian church to see the people outside the church as in need of good news. That the Corinthians have a message about how Jesus gives life and offers a better way of being in relationship with God and each other. And what Paul is really saying is that there are people in Corinth and beyond that need an invitation to see and experience the love that God has for them in Jesus. He's using his own life as an example to show what it looks like to live in response to receiving the gospel of Jesus. It is an argument or rather it is an obligation to share it with neighbors, with strangers and friends. It might become an argument, but it's supposed to be an obligation. And then Paul finishes the whole thing by saying, and by the way, if you're going to share the gospel, do it on their terms. That's where we get our famous saying from, meet them where they are at. And that's where I find the clothing analogy to be helpful in understanding what Paul means. Clothing informs us about who we are. It communicates that to others around us. And as we have mentioned, it even changes depending on where we are and what we're doing. But I think what's important to realize is that while we might wear something a little different to a funeral than a ball game, we don't just become someone else when we put something else on. No, you might love wearing boots. So when it's time to dress up for a wedding or what have you, it's quite possible that you just wear a different one than the one you worked in. You might have on a tie and a jacket, but who you are as a person has not changed, you see. You still have on boots. And so the grand point that I'm arriving to is that Paul's conclusion that he is all things for all people does not mean he just pretends to be someone he isn't. It means he spends enough time with people that he knows who they are. He knows their story, who they are as people. And in the same way we think, you know, I really want to get this job, and I'm sure the interviewer would appreciate it if I wore this, we're called to do that with people we encounter. We think, well, I've spoken to that person several times. I know this about them. I know this about them. And maybe I can connect with them there since I have been through something similar. And so we do that insofar as it is still an accurate reflection of who we are. And the reason that's important is because if anything is going to help us share our faith, it will be authenticity. Because what's at the heart of Paul's words is that God meets us where we're at. God loves us as the person we are, no matter who we are, and for our analogy's purposes, no matter what we wear. Likewise, God loves those who exist outside the community of faith, calls us to join God, and loving them as they are, without expectation that they might start dressing like me, liking the same football team as me, but with the expectation that we all might grow in relationship with Christ and each other, that God's kingdom will continue to bring more and more people in, again, no matter what we look like, what we wear, we are welcome. And the reason this passage is before us is because it's foundational to our understanding of sharing faith. Because Paul knows he can't be all things to all people, but that doesn't stop him from trying to learn about people who might be different from him, respect those differences, and then find common ground to share the gospel. And I think that's needed. That we live in the times we live in, because I think people are searching for something real, something authentic to put their hope in. Paul isn't calling us to abandon who we are as people, but to see the people outside of the community of faith as beloved by God for exactly who they are. And in order to reach them and share that love, Paul is encouraging us to know who they are. Know who they are enough to know whether this is something I wear a t-shirt to or something I put a tie on for. By that, I simply mean that we care enough about other people before that we know them before we share the gospel, that we know their story. I think being all things to all people doesn't mean we forsake our identity or things that make us who we are. 
Rather, it's a calling to see how making a meaningful connection with someone might mean we become curious about who they are. We learn who they are, find countless ways that we do relate to one another through experiences of joy, grief, sorrow, happiness, despair. All while remembering that we have a story too and to share that authentically. People can always tell, I think, when someone isn't being authentic or honest, especially children. And now more than ever, I think our world needs missionaries, locally, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in an authentic way, a way that meets others where they are at. And the reason kind of boots were just like heavy on my mind in this passage is because I met one of my absolute co closest friends because of Boots. Maybe I've shared this story before, but when I got in high school, I went to a different school than I was zoned for, and I didn't know anybody. And the only thing I knew about this school was that they were considered in the country, which was obviously a stereotype. There was lots of kinds of people there. But I didn't know that. I was 14. And so when it was time to go back to school, I asked my mother that my back-to-school shoes would be boots. I wanted to fit in. But I think you all know me well enough to know I had no business wearing boots. But it was absolutely the case that when I sat in my desk, and gosh, one of the first classes, the kid sitting next to me said, hey, I like your boots. And I looked over, and he had on the exact same pair. And we were just best friends. His were dirty. Mine were clean. <laughs> but we were just best friends from that moment on. And so what I'm saying this morning is that God really loves us for who we are. But it's also the case that God loves other people for who they are. And if we're called to share good news with others, just how much easier does it become when we at least know a little about somebody else? You might have no business wearing boots either. But you might be surprised what happens when you step out of your comfort zone for the sake of the gospel. And in that way, we can be all things to all people. We can share the love of Jesus that Jesus has shown us when we first see that his love was offered to us no matter what we look like and, again, no matter what we wear. And the same is true for everyone else. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> now I invite you to rise. We are being sent into a world in need of healing. We have been given all that we need to be God's messengers of peace. Go now into the world, rejoicing in God's presence with you. Bring the news of peace and hope to all you meet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>